Um, how's everyone doing? We got a few people in traffic. Uh, Randy Davis is, uh, should be here any minute. Um, uh, Jared said he's walking up. Uh, Lloyd Irvin is a good friend of mine. He's, uh, he f took a red eye to come here. Um, trying to think of who my mouse am I missing that said they were coming. Um, yeah, so we're good to go. We're, uh, I, I'm gonna just acknowledge something in the room. I wish it was brighter. So we're gonna think bright thoughts and and uh, and make hopefully the sun pops out and uses it. Makes... Hey man, my mom my mom always said it's your job to bring the sun out. So we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make it happen. Let's do a couple of things here since we're just kind of a smaller group than uh, last time. And I changed the seating uh, on purpose. I wanted I, instead of the horseshoe, we'll opened it up a little bit. Um, uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do intros here in a second, but I'm gonna walk through kind of a quick what's been going on the last 90 days before on my life, and then kind of I'll set a tone for what what would be awesome uh, before we kind of kick this off. Um, uh, you know, I think last 90 days I don't even know what the date was when we met. It was early August, wasn't it? August 27th. Oh, yeah, yeah, for my birthday. That's right. Yeah, I turned 40, which was uh, great. Um, Nahal was walking around my party, talking to everybody, and uh, I think he's the only sober person there, except um, <laughs> my entire staff, who they don't drink, so that's okay. Um, and Randy came by. It was a great party. Um, uh, it was one of those parties where at like 1.15 a.m., we had put up like three massive tents in our backyard and everybody from the neighborhood was there. And I saw my son Michael running around in the backyard still. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm tired. I'm tired of talking to all these people and uh, I'm exhausted. So I went to bed at 1.15 and about 4.15, Nola comes in our bedroom and goes, Eddie, could you please tell your brother that everyone's got to leave? And uh, uh, so we kicked out whoever was uh, still there. Um, it's great. Um, so, end of August, I think I told you guys I was training for Kokoro Camp, which was the seal fit thing. We're going to talk a little bit about this morning. Um, what kind of happened was I decided to start training like two and a half to three hours a day, like physically training. And if you've ever trained that much for anything, you'll notice that there's really um, about 40, like the hour prior to that and like an hour and a half after that, you really are dysfunctional. Like there's really, I was, um, the first month and a half, I went through a phase of where I'd get back into the office and literally uh, my brain was so foggy that I was, I should have just gone to a movie. I should have just gone home and just recovered. Um, that kind of had been the next, like, it, about three to four weeks into it, something kicked in where my body adjusted, so it was a little bit better, but um, working out that much time or spending that much time training, um, there's no way to slice it. You, there's no way you can be in the business and being really productive more than an hour and a half to two hours a day. Um, and I share that because um, my CFO, who works for Vinny, sent us our numbers and um, uh, October, we've had the best month uh, for the whole year, uh, net profit-wise. We're, we're just surpassing a million dollars net. Um, after all, salaries are already paid, so that's net net to the bottom line in uh, 2015. It's, I'll tell you this. I'm, well, yeah, you know, but I, I want to emphasize something. It's better than last year, and our revenue is uh, more than or less than half. So uh, there's probably more questions that'll come out of that than answers, but we're asking a lot of questions right now. Um, I think a lot of the traffic and sales we were getting a year ago just were, were showing up on the report as profitable, but they weren't. And um, getting our tech straight, straightened out too has made a big difference. Uh, cutting loose relationships within the business, and that doesn't necessarily always mean um, employees, but there, but some some of it does. Um, my operations person, who's been with me seven years, quit in the beginning of October, and um, to give a lot of credit to our crew in the back there, uh, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. 
because because they uh, you, you guys don't even know what I'm giving them credit for because they wrote her right out they uh, they made the office condition so bad that she had to quit uh, uh, yeah they all assumed it was me but after I've investigated uh, the culprits are back there <laughs> drinking Bailey's and coffee uh, 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 so I think a question that we, you know, like one of the things, and then here's the funny thing. At, that month, we had our best month of the year. It very, um, there's probably some, when we do some open mastermind talking to the group, I think there's some just really psychological things that as a CEO, you need to get in alignment now, or if you haven't, that when adversity hits the business, you, f you always are finding ways to make those adversity points be reasons why you're going to be more successful, not why you might have a month, a bad month, or next quarter might be a disaster. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be full disclosure. I'm dealing with an issue with Salesforce right now that is the byproduct of probably the most dysfunctional employee I had ever hired in my entire freaking career. Actually, let me rephrase that for camera, a, a subcontractor. Um, because who, who signed an agreement kind of without my total permission and hired like tech teams that were just disasters and uh, um, Justin had the good graces to have to deal with some of them uh, in efforts to clean that up. Um, so how do you compartmentalize now a lawsuit with a billion dollar company with also starting to do that? And I think I do that fairly well. In fact, Vinny calls me a lot to make sure that I'm not compartmentalizing things so much because I have a really good ability to completely shut things out if I want to and focus on what I, and um, that works really well when you're in cold water in the Pacific. It does not work very well when you still have to make, it works very well when you're trying to grow a business. It does not work very well when something has to be dealt with, right? When you have to deal with attorneys, all things that we all in this room love. Um, you know, it's, it's great stuff. Um, so anyhow, just real quick. So October wasn't a fluke because on month to date, this month we're on track to the same numbers. And so we're really looking at, uh, well, I'll go into a couple of my priorities. I'm setting the stage slightly to create priorities in your brain a little bit of how we might work as a group this week a little bit differently than prior, where um, I'm kind of sharing my laundry, good and bad and ugly, early to create a tone, okay? Um, so then training for Kokoro, I already talked about that. Um, three weeks before Kokoro, uh, Kathleen had resigned. Um, and then um, the other thing that's kind of happening, and you know, this term tectonic shift, you know, that I'm gonna talk about with Kokoro Camp is like, if you look at like, um, Tsunamis, right? It, tsunamis are the byproduct of an earthquake that happens miles and miles, miles in the ocean that no one sees. But then the end result happens over here. And I had this kind of epiphany where I was thinking about that. Most things that have meaning that actually can create wealth in your business or in your life, relationships or whatever, usually are, do not start off as a big wave, right? It's something that happens underneath the surface that you focus on over a period of time that builds up. The question is, is how much effort and focus and consistency and maturity can you withstand that there's very little uh, external results showing you that what you're doing is popping out right. And, and here's an example is um, today, you know, you guys know a guy on EO Fire like John Lee Dumas, like he's like one of the top podcasters. Well, he interviewed me eight weeks ago. Today that's launching. There's part of my feeling was that like the podcasting <coughs> model, it takes a while to build momentum for that. And I, I want to just kind of convey that I, I believe a lot everything in our life that's worth doing requires this sense of I'm doing things underneath the surface that no one else can see that's going to ex, exit out a better result than what I'm currently experiencing. 
but I don't believe our society is operating that way. We're so, it's so easy to check Facebook and, and feel good about your friend liking a photo that you posted rather than ignoring all that and focusing on what has meaning and you can determine what that meaning is, right? Um, so, so in our, our business right now, like we're, our top, I'm gonna give you our top priorities in the, on the uh, new Marine Essential side and I'll share a little bit of the top priorities like on the Ed O'Keefe show side is um, we brought uh, Chris Stelzer, who is a mastermind member on our team part-time to just, his only job is to work with um, our conversion, just cleaning up our conversion process. Something happened where like I had that most dysfunctional employee and we, we changed things that were working very, very well that just, they didn't work as well as they used to. Some of that's fatigue, some of that's market fatigue, whatever, but I'm not a big believer in this thing that you can't, like look at Instaflex, look at some of these companies that have been around so long. I, I, I believe if you got a great product and a, a good marketing mind, you can take something and just keep reworking it and have great longevity out of it. Um, big lesson with Marine D3, by the way, is that it's such a good product that people repurchase it and use it, you know? Um, that's a criteria. Go ahead, Vinny. Were you going to say something? Oh. I was going to say, don't overshadow that. The reoccurring part of that is the critical value piece. So having repurchasing ability in your product is, you can have a great product, but if you don't have people coming back and buying it, um, you know, sub-value products have people coming back and buying them. So, right. I mean, the, the, the real value to Instaflex is they figured out a way to continue to have people come back and buy it. It's so hard to spend all the money to keep buying new yeah. customers. Yeah. So that's one of the things that was so huge for you. And, and by the way, that wasn't like a, uh, that was something that you have to get, a, like one of the principles I teach in like in the book, Time Collapse, and you're seeing the, the, the rough cover right now, is like um, most people in our society today never get to the third mile. Like, you know, they talk about like, they talk about like, you talk about where's success at, and let's just say you break it up into, here, here's your uh, success point, which whatever that might be, right? Um, we, are such an, we are in such a start and stop society that you can't get that kind of intelligence if you never get to this part of the process. It's just hard because like, you, you need some things to go right, some things to go wrong for you to step back and be like, all right, well, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, our net profit improves by 25 percentage points or 30, not that much, about 23 percentage points. And you're like, where's this coming from? It's like, well, our, our 30 something thousand consistent openers, right? Who are our customer file, which we have 80, we have over 100,000 on file, but you know how the fatigue and time, whatever, are, re, are, are repurchasing. Okay, so let's just go out and buy more media, right? I mean, that's my joke. Like, that's, that's what you think is like, let's just go out here and buy more non-qualified customers where for no money at all, we can sit here and think and be like, what three phenomenal more products can we bring to these existing 30,000 that will fund the rest of my life, right? So, so by doing that, that's the thought process. But guys, I, I wanted to share that with you. It, it came because I was willing to make a thousand mistakes to get here, right? And suck at a lot of things. I mean, I, I'm, trust me. <laughs> he was like, I'm done working with you. I was like, I totally understand. <laughs> I, I really do. I'm just, I'm just glad, you know, I totally understand. Uh, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. <laughs> you know. Um, so, one of the second priority, I'll just write, I'll actually I'll write this down, because I, I wanted to share this with you. So like our first priority was to just clean up and start buying test traffic again. So I went to, when, um, when the, um, a slight, I'm gonna share a slight dichotomy of thought, and I want to just kind of throw us by the, the The challenge with, 
And this is good for any of you guys who are operational people for the team leaders, right? So just listen to this here. The challenge is, is that if I'm a growth guy and I like pushing the envelope, and you hire an operations person who feels like it's their job to keep things organized, there needs to be a really healthy balance that I'm going to mess things up as we grow and you need to be completely happy and oak, and, I, and it's really got to be framed. You got to understand that your happiness comes from assisting with us by helping clean that up and help build out the systems. If that agreement's not in place, then the operations person or tech person or whatever, whoever's trying to clean it up, is going to get frustrated with your desire to grow. Okay? And so by when the change in our operation happened this past month, for, there was a lot of things I've tried bringing to the table that just kind of were getting stuck on the someday we'll do it because it's not organized enough. Am I being clear on like what I'm sharing? And so by all of a sudden, I, am I be, like, so, so when Kathleen left, there were things and priorities that I would consider highly important. I was trying to make a shift into completely empowering the organization to run without me so that I can finish my book, grow my podcast, grow the mastermind, grow the seminar business, start teaching again. But their growth strategies that I teach you were not happening at the speed and pace that I would say is required in order to grow a business. And so when someone decides to leave, the, f the first thing you need to look at is like, okay, where you always, I always go to cash flow. How do I make sure we can increase cash flow and increase growth? That's where I go. And so by just going back to that really quickly, boom, and removing blockages to that, we went from netting under uh, six figures to netting well over six figures in just 30 day period, boom. You know, it's like, well, what the fuck was different than 30 days prior? Removing blockages and friction, which I'll talk about probably tomorrow morning a lot, because it's very important. 